You know those super slick animated logos you see? The ones that just pop? Oh yeah, or like those product visuals where you see every little detail spinning around. Exactly. Or even those uh, abstract motion pieces and videos that just grab you. How is that magic actually made? Right, because you look at it, you think, wow, that's incredible. But is someone really sitting there moving hundreds of little bits around by hand? Oh, probably not, right? Usually no. Uh, the kind of complex dynamic stuff we see now, it relies on really smart workflows and, well, some seriously powerful software. And today, that's what we're diving into. We're looking at two of the big names in the 3D world behind this magic, Blender and Cinema 4D. Yep, and we've got a good pile of sources to work from. There's a Blender Geometry Nodes tutorial, uh, some no. detailed stuff on Cinema 4D's more graph features. A beginner's guide to C4D's whole workflow, modeling, rendering, blah. Industry comparisons, yeah. and even this really interesting Reddit thread. It's from a longtime C4D pro who's actually switching over to Blender, so different perspectives. Okay, so our mission here is to pull out the key ideas from all of this. We want to give you a solid feel for, you know, the principles behind making complex motion graphics in these tools. And the big differences in how they work, why artists might pick one over the other. Think of it as uh, getting the core concepts without sweating every single menu option. Ready to unpack it. Let's do it. All right, let's kick off with Blender. Specifically, a feature that's really shaken things up for motion graphics artists using it geometry nodes ah geometry nodes yeah it's blender's um procedural powerhouse system and the real insight here the big idea is getting away from moving individual things around manually right you're building systems instead you based click. on rules exactly because trying to keyframe say hundreds or thousands of little objects one by one it just it doesn't scale it's ah. not practical for the really complex animations. Makes sense. I mean, older tools like uh, array modifiers helped a bit with repetition. They were a step, for sure. Yeah. Useful for simple stuff. But geometry notes, that gives you way, way more dynamic and intricate control. The core concept often is instancing. Instancing. Okay. Yeah. And think of it not like making tons of heavy copies that slow everything down. It's more like telling Blender, hey, put a placeholder for this object here and here and maybe over here too. So you use one master object, like an arrow maybe? Yep, like in one of the sources. You instance that single arrow onto points, maybe points arranged in a circle or along a line, whatever you need. And the animation that comes from controlling those instances procedurally right. through nodes. That's the key. Yeah. You build this network of nodes, like uh, connecting building blocks. You might use nodes for math or to get the scene time. Okay. And combine them. Like you could use separate and combine XYZ nodes with the scene time node, maybe some math functions, and suddenly those arrows are rippling outwards from the center, huh. all driven by that node setup. You're defining the rule for the motion, not drawing the motion frame by frame. And one thing highlighted in the sources is that this whole node setup is non-destructive. That sounds important. Oh, it's absolutely crucial, especially in professional work. Say the client wants a change, or you just need to tweak the timing or the feel. Yeah. You don't have to redo hours of manual animation. You just adjust a value or two in the node tree, maybe swap out a node, and boom, the whole complex animation updates automatically. That's huge. That flexibility must save so much time. Massive time saver. And it encourages you to experiment more, you know? because changes aren't so painful. The sources mention three essentials for getting going with geometry nodes in motion graphics, time, order, and selection. Right, and it's not just like settings to click. This trio represents the real building blocks for those rule-based animations. Mm -hmm. Time, you control that procedurally, often with math nodes linked to the timeline so things move continuously without needing manual keyframes. Okay, continuous motion and order and selection. That's all about which instances get affected and when. You could select them based on their number, their index, or use textures to create random patterns or control where an effect happens, or even select based on uh, their position or the direction they're facing. Lots of ways to target things. So these complex effects aren't just magic buttons someone clicks. It's the artist using these basic node operations, instancing, moving, selecting, and figuring out how to combine them. Precisely. The nodes are the tools, the building blocks. But the artistry is in designing that system, figuring out the logic to get the look you want. You stack and combine simple operations to get these incredibly detailed results. Gotcha. The sources mentioned examples like rotating things based on where they are or using math to offset animation. Yeah, or making an array of cans assemble themselves. Stuff that would be 
frankly, a nightmare or just impossible to do with older methods becomes, well, manageable with a node tree, sometimes just a few nodes. And it's not just for abstract swirly patterns, right? It sounds useful for more concrete stuff, too. Totally. It's about controlling appearance and motion based on rules. Yeah. So, yeah, presentations where elements fly in, UI mockups, product animations where things need to assemble or disassemble dynamically. Very versatile. Okay, let's switch gears then. Let's talk Cinema 4D. It's been a huge player in motion graphics for ages, right? Largely because of its MoGraph tools. Absolutely. MoGraph's kind of legendary in the motion graphics world, mm -hmm. often described as uh, simple to pick up but incredibly powerful once you dig in. And the heart of it is the cloner object. Cloner. Okay, is that similar to Blender's instancing concept? Very much so, yeah. The cloner takes an object you give it and makes live copies. They call them clones. Right. And you can range these clones in a ton of different ways, along a line, in the circle, a grid, scattered across another object's surface, following a path, loads of options. And you control things like how many clones, how far apart. Yep, easily. Yeah. And importantly, you can animate those parameters over time. So it's your go-to for making grids of things or maybe taking text and treating each letter as a separate clone you can animate. Okay, so the cloner sets things up. But how do you get those clones moving in complex ways, like the ripples we talked about in Blender? Ah, that's where effectors come into play. Effectors are the tools that actually manipulate the clones. Manipulate how? They can control pretty much anything about the clones. Their position, scale, rotation, even their color. And they often do it based on rules or data. You might have a formula effector using math or a sound effector that makes clones react to music. Oh, cool. Yeah. The sources say there are like 17 different types, and the real power comes from combining them. You layer effectors to build up complex motion. So that combination cloner creating the objects, effectors animating them, that's the core C4D motion graphics workflow. That's the core aha mm. moment for a lot of people learning C4D mode graph, yeah. You're affecting groups of objects based on rules defined by the effectors, not pushing individual keyframes. Makes sense. But MogaGraph is just one part. C4D is a full 3D suite, like Blender. Our sources mention the rest of the workflow, too. That's right. MogaGraph is key for the motion graphics side, but you still need to, you know, make the things you're going to clone, give them materials, light the scene, get a final image out. So standard 3D stuff. Exactly. Yeah. The sources touch on C4D's modeling tools, different ways to build objects, combining basic shapes, using splines, hmm. which you can bring in from Illustrator. That's a common workflow. Ah, vector paths from Illustrator. Yeah. Then applying materials using different channels like color or transparency, though some channels like glow for making things seem like they emit light were described as maybe a bit basic in the source material we looked at. And rendering, obviously critical. Crucial for the final look. Setting up good lighting is key for realism, naturally. C4D has its render settings, anti-aliasing, and so on. But a really important bit for motion graphics and visual effects is its ability to render in multiple passes. Multiple passes? What does that let you do? It means you can output separate images for just the color, just the shadows, just the reflections, maybe an object ID mask, mm -hmm. all from the same render. Oh. And that gives you massive flexibility later in compositing software like After Effects. You could tweak the color of just the reflections or maybe add a video playing on a TV screen you rendered long after the 3D part is done. That sounds powerful for post-production. Now, does C4D have something like Blender's nodes for logic or connecting things? It does, yeah. That's called Expresso. Now, it's a bit different from Geometry Nodes, which is mostly about manipulating the geometry itself. Expresso is C4D's node system for linking parameters between different objects or settings. Linking parameters? Like what? Like, uh, you can use it to make a dial, control the rotation of clock hands. Or maybe make the size of one object automatically control the color of another. It's about building logical connections and dependencies using a visual node interface, setting up relationships. Got it. So less about generating geometry, more about controlling how things behave together. Exactly. And the sources also gave a quick mention to other specialized bits in C4D. Things like the Sketch and Tune module, which lets you get non-photorealistic looks, making your 3D render look like a cartoon or a technical drawing and XREFs, which are basically ways to manage link files, useful for keeping complex projects organized. Okay, so we've seen Blender's procedural geometry nodes approach and Cinema 4D's established MoGraph system with cloners and effectors. How do these two worlds stack up based on what we read? Well, the big takeaway seems to be that both offer really powerful ways to create complex motion graphics, ways that, you know, get you beyond trying to do it all by hand. Right, different tools, similar goal. Pretty much. 
Blender leans heavily on geometry nodes now for that procedural power. Cinema 4D has that well-oiled MoGraph and effector system, plus Expresso for the parameter linking. But that core idea using rules, relationships, systems to drive complexity, it's there in both. What about jumping in as a beginner? Is one easier? The general consensus in the sources um, mm -hmm. seems to be that Cinema 4D often gets called out for having a more intuitive interface, maybe easier to grasp initially. Yeah. Blender, historically at least, had a reputation for a steeper learning curve, though its interface has improved a lot. But here's the thing, the concepts. Procedural thinking, instancing, using effectors or nodes to modify things. That knowledge translates pretty well between them. That's good to know. What about industry use? C4D seems really dug in at some studios, right? Why is that? Yeah, that came up a fair bit. There's history there. C4D, along with tools like Maya and 3 Max, they had a big head start. Right. So large studios built entire production pipelines around them, trained their artists on them. Switching that whole setup, it's a massive, expensive disruption, even if new tools get powerful. And there's the support aspect, too. Huge difference, yeah. yeah. Big studios working on high-stakes projects with tight deadlines, they often rely on paid support contracts. They need to know if a critical bug hits, they can get it fixed now. Commercial software like C4D offers that formal support structure. Whereas Blender is open source. Right. Amazing community support, incredibly active developers. But there isn't that formal company liability or dedicated support line for a studio to bank on in the same way. Yeah. That's a big factor for established pipelines. But Blender's definitely making waves, isn't it? Oh, absolutely undeniable. Yeah. Its capabilities have exploded, especially with things like geometry nodes. And its biggest ace, of course, is that it's free and open source. Which means? Massive adoption. Indie artists, smaller studios, freelancers, they can jump in without that huge upfront cost. And we're seeing it creep into larger companies, too in specific areas that Reddit thread mentioned the automotive industry using it more. Interesting. And render engines play a role in this ecosystem too. Definitely part of the package. Blender's got EVE, which is super fast, real time almost. Great for testing things out, stylized looks, quick animations. And Cycles. Cycles is its heavyweight photorealistic renderer. Slower, but gives those really accurate results. Needs more power, maybe render farms for big jobs. And C4D's rendering. Also very capable, with its own built-in options and support for third-party engines. And as we mentioned, its strength in multi-pass rendering is a big plus for standard motion graphics pipelines that rely heavily on compositing. What about plugins and add-ons? Sources mention C4D has a really mature, extensive plugin market. Things like X particles for like super advanced particle effects. Okay. Blender's add-on scene is booming. Lots of amazing stuff on places like Blender Market. But someone switching from C4D might find they need to grab a few add-ons, which are usually much cheaper than C4D plugins, to replicate specific workflows they were used to. Okay, so let's try and wrap this all up for you, the listener. What's the main thing to take away from this deep dive? I think the core learning is that both Blender and Cinema 4D offer these really smart ways to create complex motion graphics, moving past doing everything manually. They use concepts like proceduralism, instancing, and specialized tools like geometry nodes in Blender or MoGraph and effectors in C4D. Right. You're defining rules and relationships, letting the software handle the complexity based on those rules rather than keyframing every tiny detail. And understanding that basic idea, that approach, is valuable no matter what. Immensely valuable, yeah. Whether you choose Blender or C4D or maybe even work with people using the other tool, mm -hmm. getting your head around how these systems work, proceduralism, instancing, effectors controlling things, that gives you a really solid foundation. The knowledge carries over. Exactly. So hopefully this deep dive, pulling out these specific insights from the sources, gives you some of those aha uh, uh -huh moments, a bit of a shortcut past the information overload, helps you understand the thinking behind modern motion design, and maybe make more informed choices about where you want to focus or just appreciate what these tools can do. So we've seen Blender really pushing forward with its flexible geometry nodes. And Cinema 4D sure. with its super solid, industry-tested Morn Graph system. Different paths, sometimes overlapping, to tackle these complex motion graphics jobs. And both are always changing, always evolving. Constantly. The choice between them. It often boils down to the specific project, uh, the team you're working with, budget, obviously, and sometimes just what you learned first or feel most comfortable in. Which leaves us with something to chew on. As these incredibly powerful free tools like Blender keep adding features, sometimes leapfrogging commercial ones, mm -hmm. how might that shift the balance in the motion graphics industry over the next, say, five or 10 years? Will those established pipelines start to bend? 
And what does that mean if you're just starting out now or maybe even thinking about switching tools yourself? Like or subscribe, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Merci.